So the paper is called Fundamentality and Levels in Everettian Quantum Mechanics. It links with uh, my book, which Antonio kindly mentioned. It also links with a series of other papers, all of which uh, have the phrase Everettian Quantum Mechanics in the title. <coughs> There's uh, three or four of them um, that I've written that kind of develop essentially different aspects of the metaphysics of uh, a Everettian worldview. Uh, the, the kind of broad theme of that series of papers has been that Everettians have done a great job of showing us how it might be that uh, quantum theory is all we need um, in order to uh, understand processes, including measurement, but also including kind of all of the, the random happenstance that goes on around us. Um, uh, so that you don't need to add anything to the, the, the unitary uh, quantum uh, evolution, however you understand that. Um, and in, in showing how that might be possible, they've tended to focus on, obviously, uh, aspects of the ontology that, that, that have to do directly with the physics, and especially on the probability problem, uh, the aspects of that that have to do with things like decision theory and uh, the mathematics of probability. I've wanted to uh, explore the ways in which uh, you could give a metaphysics that would be adequate to these sorts of moves that Everettians have been making. So I wanted to explore in, in an earlier paper the kind of ontology um, that could be uh, the ontology of worlds and their overlap or lack of that could be combined uh, with modern Everettian quantum mechanics. And I've explored the metaphysics of probability in modern Everettian quantum mechanics. And this paper switches to uh, attending to how the notion of fundamentality in particular gets deployed in the context of Everettian quantum mechanics. And my claim is gonna be an initial claim is that modern Everettians uh, rely heavily on a notion of fundamentality to make their view work, to ward off prominent objections, um, to render a whole range of serious looking objections, something that doesn't even apply when you understand the view properly. Uh, I, I'm gonna suggest that distinctions between level of fundamentality plays a huge role in the defense um, uh, of contemporary Everettian position. And uh, that you get a corresponding uh, system of levels that Everettians are effectively uh, committed to that goes beyond the system of levels, physics, chemistry, biology, kind of familiar scientific levels. Um, that's the claim anyway. And I'm gonna claim that kind of existing Everettian proposals do need a notion of, of fundamentality and levels uh, that can do the job. Um, and then I'm going to explore some ideas from contemporary metaphysics, uh, that could fill these gaps. Um, I'm going to say it's relatively easy, actually, to find uh, metaphysical concepts, metaphysical notions that will do the jobs the Everettian need. Um, but uh, I'm going to conclude by arguing that uh, one of the most simplest and familiar approaches to uh, fundamentality and levels that relies entirely on the notion of supervenience isn't a good fit for Everettians. Um, so the, that final argument is going to draw on some specific features of my own version of the Everett worldview, which brings uh, the metaphysics of modality in to the interpretation in a central way. But most of the discussion uh, up to section five um, is not, I hope, going to draw on my specific modal twist on the many words interpretation. It's just gonna draw on aspects of the many words interpretation, the way it's developed by its most powerful vocal modern proponents, um, people especially like Simon Saunders, David Wallace, um, Hilary Greaves in her philosophy of physics mode, um, David Deutsch to some extent, though uh, there may be some differences with respect to the role of, dis of um, decoherence in, in, in Deutsch's view. Um, and broadly speaking, most people that are interested in the many worlds interpretation and take seriously the prospect that it might be made to work uh, are interested in this, what I would call contemporary, decoherence-based Everettian quantum mechanics. So this is Everettian quantum mechanics that uh, 
emphasizes the role of decoherence in solving the measurement problem and in particular solving the problem of the preferred basis uh, in which measurements are counted as determinate, which events are counted as determinate uh, in the view. And Simon Saunders especially um, uh, was amongst the first to emphasize how uh, an, a version of many worlds which uh, takes the worlds in the multiverse, the different Everett worlds, to be approximately defined uh, through the process of decoherence, as opposed to precisely defined through some stipulation, uh, was a kind of viable and true to the physics way of going. And David Wallace has taken up and <laughs> prominently championed this version of the many words interpretation, again, it's like decoherence only approaches. Um, and one of the key features of this is that it uh, identifies different standards of determinacy, which are at play at the level of the universal state and at the level of the multiverse of Everett world, the kind of collection of Everett worlds that one gets out of the universal state. Uh, in particular, the, the, the fundamental physical ontology for these authors is uh, precise. It's the wave function of the universe. Um, whereas the multiverse, this emergent collection of emergent worlds, is inherently imprecise. It doesn't have sharp boundaries. Uh, how many worlds there are in it, this is a point that both Saunders and Wallace emphasize a lot, um, depends on uh, somewhat arbitrary looking choices of fine grading of the decoherence basis, which the view says, or at least the decoherence only version of Ever Everettians tell us shouldn't matter. There's no kind of physical significance to the choice there. Um, and so there's no physical significance to say the number of worlds in the Everett multiverse, uh, the number of branches that are of a particular type emerging from a given interaction. Um, and if there's no determinacy in the number of worlds, there's no equally no determinacy in their precise nature because uh, you know, the individual kind of events in the world, how kind of determinate those are, is linked to the number. You kind of carve the worlds more finely and each world is a little bit more determinate. But continue that process indefinitely and uh, the decoherence conditions cease to uh, apply and one doesn't get a successful solution to the, the measurement problem out of decoherence. That's, that's the, the shape of the, the concern. That's why uh, Everettians tend to use uh, this distinction between the determinate fundamental reality, the universal wave function, and an indeterminate emergent reality, decoherent worlds. And this uh, gets emphasized a huge amount by Everettians. Uh, Wallace, I mean, makes its way into the one of the three words of the main title of Wallace's book, The Emergent Multiverse. Um, and emergent, I mean here. Thank you, Antonio, uh, for reading from the handout. Um, and Saunders has said this is Wallace's uh, kind of killer observation that Everett worlds are just like ordinary high level ontology, the ontology of tables, chairs, Tigers, Wallace's favorite example, um, you know, purely natural processes, stars, um, these things aren't fundamental. Um, and you know, part and parcel of their not being fundamental is that they don't have precise boundaries, uh, that there's no, there's, there's no precise determinate definition of a star um, that fixes you know, to within an anemometer where the star uh, ends and space begins, the star's atmosphere begins, perhaps. Um, th these are the kinds of things that Saunders and Wallace say. Uh, they say Everett worlds are just like any other piece of high level scientific ontology and demands for a precise definition of them are misplaced. Just like you wouldn't ask a biologist studying tigers to provide a precise definition of tiger in microchemical, um, well, you might say a lot, you might think that the DNA does give a lot of information about the tiger, but nonetheless, like a complete description of the tiger in terms of chemistry 
is uh, neither available nor particularly useful, perhaps, um, uh, if you want to uh, theorize about tiger behavior. And the, the and this goes all the more so the more fundamental it's when you look into fundamental physics. So Wallace's claim that Saunders has enthusiastically endorsed is that the Everettian ontology is no different from the Everettian ontology of worlds, uh, the individual world in the multiverse are no different in principle from the high level entities of special sciences with which we're more familiar, like tigers, like stars. And we do regard tigers and stars as non-fundamental uh, and it is their non-fundamental status it's natural to think, which justifies us in not thinking that until we have a precise definition of tiger, there's an important gap in our understanding of the world. Tigers are the kinds of things that don't need precise definitions in terms of microphysics. So, says Wallace, says, says Saunders, uh, Everett worlds are the kinds of things that don't need precise descriptions and precise definitions in terms of the microphysics, because they're non-fundamental. And so this, uh, this feature of being non-fundamental high-level ontology is fending off demands uh, for a precise definition of the world of a kind that decoherent theory can't really provide. Um, and so it, seem, it kind of seems to be playing the role of a kind of essential defensive move. So I'm, I'm not going to dwell uh, much longer on, on the, the ways in which fundamentality uh, kind of making a, a kind of in principle, I'd like to make a watertight argument that, that Everettianism kind of cannot succeed without a notion of fundamentality. Hopefully I've given like enough of a kind of sense of the general shape of the reasons for thinking that it needs something like fundamentality and kind of highlighted a few of the ways in which its proponents do at least seem to say that a notion of fundamentality is playing an important role. Now I'm going to switch to a more kind of constructive mode. I'm going to switch to a mode of basically uh, exploring and construct, exploring and then constructing a like, specific model of uh, relative fundamentality and levels within an Everettian set that identifies some levels, identifies some what some of them as fundamental and others as successively less fundamental and identifies dependence relations between those levels. These are the kinds of things that uh, metaphysicians are in the business of doing. They're in the business of developing theories of dependence, theories of fundamentality, which are kind of adequate to the subtlety of whatever physics might throw up. And you know, the, a, a negative view about uh, metaphysics is that it kind of is just no use at doing that. It's not very good at doing that. And the, you know, it, plenty of kind of anti-metaphysics philosophers of physics might be inclined to think that um, the kind of conceptual frameworks which physics, which metaphysics has, has been producing over the last 20, 30 years are kind of altogether unsuited to applications in physics and are kind of um, fit only for like, as James Ladyman might say, philosophy of A-level chemistry. I don't think that's true. I think that the approaches to dependence and fundamentality which have been developed in recent metaphysics are kind of quite sophisticated enough uh, to serve the purposes of Everettians in these appeals to fundamentality. At least so I'm gonna claim. Um, you may think that kind of considering the application of these approaches to the Everettian setup and the like evident inadequacy of what I'm gonna construct by doing that reflects badly on these metaphysical notions. Perhaps that's your take home message from this talk. But um, another take home message, a more positive one, would be that there is at least something useful to be uh, um, uh, obtained by considering the application of contemporary metaphysics as developed, maybe with an eye on physics, but not kind of solely in the context of physics, to the, to the, to the physics context, for example, in the the Everett setting. So that's all really by way of introduction. Um, moving into section two on the first page of the handout. Um, some, of, some of you, you know, 
fans of David Wallace, I mean, many of us are, 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 are fans of David Wallace, um, might think that Wallace has got this all sorted out. Uh, he uses Dennett's notion of real pattern um, and he defends a account of the metaphysics of science called ontic structural realism, uh, which he links to Dennett's notion of real pattern um, uh, of the kind of type in, set out by Lady Mellon Ross, this ontic structural realism that Wallace likes. Um, and Wallace is like completely content to his own satisfaction that uh, somewhere between that being the correct metaphysics for science and that being a workable enough metaphysics for science that we don't need to spend any more time thinking about metaphysics. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm more sympathetic to the second than the first there, but in both cases, I, I kind of think that ontic structural realism as it's been currently presented is, is not uh, a kind of um, straightforward and coherent option that one can just opt for and uh, Problems. I think ontic structural realism is has some problems. It's it's you know, numerous uh, sorts of objections you can throw at it, um, uh, and it's also not as thoroughly developed by kind of the standards of a metaphysician as uh, we would like. Um, Ted Sider has a recent book, um, The Tools of Metaphysics and the Metaphysics of Science, a large part of which is given over to exploring contemporary structuralism in the philosophy of physics and trying to make precise sense of it in various ways and concluding that you know, there are some ambiguities and potential tensions in the way ontic structural realism is, is typically presented. And I, I tend to agree with a lot of that, that critique in, of, of, of Sider in that, in that recent book. Um, but I don't want to make this about ontic structural realism. Uh, so let me let me just say, this is what I'm going to be exploring in the, the next half hour or so is, uh, you can think of it as an alternative to an ontic structural realist approach, or to the extent that you like both ontic structural realism and what I'm going to do, you could think of this as like a partial explication of an ontic structural realist approach. Um, uh, ontic structural realists do take seriously the kind of notions of metaphysical dependence that I'm going to talk about. They do it with, the, you know, holding their nose. Uh, but they, people like James Lady Mann do, um, do, do think in these sorts of terms. So, diving in then, um, what we want is to understand the sense in which the universal quantum state is fundamental, the emergent ontology of worlds is non-fundamental. We may want to understand more as well, I think we do want to understand more, but that's like the, the, the basic starting point. How do we model that? Um, and the natural way of modeling that is in terms of uh, asymmetric uh, dependence, asymmetric, you know, in my, my preference, uh, explanatory uh, dependence. That is to say, the non-fundamental is in some sense there because of the fundamental, whereas the same is not true. It's not true that the fundamental is there and is the way it is because of the non-fundamental being there and being the way it is. So there's a kind of one way direction of explanation from the fundamental to the non-fundamental. By bringing explanation into it, perhaps I'm already like stacking the deck. Um, there's a one, you could one, call it one way detect direction of determination if you want to make it uh, strip an explan you know, the explanatory um, implication away, or you could, you could talk about dependence. These are, there are various advantages or disadvantages to these uh, technologies. Um, but I do think what we need is, a, is an asymmetric relationship uh, such that in the, in the idiom of determination, the fundamental determines the non-fundamental, but not vice versa. Um, and one very common, very familiar uh, uh, way of, of cashing this out in metaphysics has been supervenience. And although supervenience has got a, a bit of a bad press, it's, it's often criticized far too quickly in these terms. Although supervenience itself, no change in A without a change in B, um, uh, can hold symmetrically, like, you know, when A and B are logically equivalent, each supervenes on the other, um, but uh, that doesn't um, uh, that doesn't establish a one-way relationship, you know, equivalence is a, is a symmetric relationship. 
Um, but of course, we can construct a relationship of one way supervenience quite easily out of the relationship of supervenience. Uh, so it's on the handout, A one way supervenes on B. If A supervenes on B, B does not supervene on A. That is, there uh, can be no change in A without a change in B. Um, but there can be a change in B without a change in A. Um, that relationship of one way supervenience is, I think, a very powerful one. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of modality. I'm a fan of what can be done with modality. And I think a lot of what we want out of <coughs> uh, fundamentality in philosophy of science, philosophy of physics, can often be captured with this. Um, I also think that this notion of one-way supervenience is likely to be entailed by any uh, rival notion. This is like the weakest plausible contender on the table. Um, but lots of people don't think that uh, supervenience, even one-way supervenience in general, can be what we're looking for. Excuse me, when it comes to uh, dependence in physics. Um, or, in, or anywhere else, in, because um, the claim, the, the objection that's made is that one supervenience, one way supervenience isn't sufficiently explanatory. Supervenience is a kind of modal correlation. It just kind of highlights correlation between the possibilities. It says, um, whenever this kind of thing is this kind of way, then these other kinds of things are, are also that other kind of way. It's just kind of the result of a scan across the, the, the space of possibilities and kind of checking how things are at all of them. And a lot of people regard that as not intrinsically explanatory. You've kind of, you can identify a, a modal pattern, a pattern of modal covariation, but simply identifying a pattern of modal covariation doesn't, isn't, isn't explanatory. It's not, uh, it, it, it doesn't give us what we're looking for um, when we're looking for de determination. So this line of thought goes, um, where there's a genuine determination between one kind of fact and another kind of fact, uh, that will entail that there can't be a kind of change in um, the one without a change in the other, but that's just a kind of a symptom. The underlying cause is like the robust determination relation there. Um, so, so this claim is that mere, mere, mere supervenience, even one-way supervenience, it does not explain. That's become very popular in philosophy of mind, for example, that sort of view. Um, and I'm moderately sympathetic to that. I think there's, I, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about that objection, about that, that, that general line of thought. I think it, yeah, there's an important point to it and also um, it overlooks something. But I don't think that matters for our particular purposes here because I think there's a unusual and ever specific reason not to use one-way supervenience in constructing an Everettian worldview, uh, which relates to the role of modality in the Everettian picture and my prior understanding of that. So we'll leave that to section five. Um, but for now, you can either take it that it's this kind of general supervenience doesn't explain kind of worry that is leading us to look beyond supervenience, or it's this kind of long-term worry that's going to come up again in section five uh, about the application of modality to Everett more generally. That is going to make supervenience less of a of a useful candidate here. Um, but either way, I think there's kind of those are two different reasons um, of rather different kinds to look for accounts of fundamentality and dependence that go beyond uh, one-way supervenience. So I'm going to talk about two in this talk, and, and they're on the handout: um, grounding and concept fundamentality. So these are both. Uh, contemporary metaphysical frameworks, uh, which are effectively rivals, um, but which perform a large part of the same, uh, uh, thanks again, Antonio, which do a large part of the same uh, job uh, when it comes to giving like a robust metaphysical conception of, of fundamentality and, and levels. Um, so grounding is this, not, is this relationship that's supposed to be hold, able to hold between any kinds of facts, 
Um, some people think you can even, you know, I can hold between like facts and objects directly, um, which uh, is something like kind of the the the, the glue of the met of, of of metaphysics. Uh, it is uh, for in proponents like Jonathan Schaffer, um, what metaphysics is about is what grounds what. It's about uncovering the relationship of explanatory dependence that holds between things. Um, and one reason why people like grounding a lot is because it seems to enable one to kind of bypass a lot of the details. One can compare very different theories of some subject matter, say the consciousness, say consciousness, by asking like, so kind of what, what grounds what according to this theory? What grounds what according to that theory? And different theories may have, turn out to have a kind of a lot in common with what they, they, they attribute to the grounding structure of the world, even if they look superficially somewhat different. Um, so, so grounding is, is something that people like because it enables easy kind of comparison of different theories within metaphysics. Um, uh, and it seems to be able to apply to any subject matter. That's part of its, its idea. So it's a kind of flexible idea. And that kind of built-in flexibility is just what we need. You may think that it's kind of one thing to say, kind of just, kind of just announced by fiat that your primitive notion has the kind of flexibility you need, and that's a that's something we can we can talk about. But that's that's effectively what's going on here. Grounding is is defined in such a way um, as an intrinsically explanatory notion, which can re relate uh, kind of facts on uh, on the left hand side to facts on the right hand side, such that the facts on the right hand side hold because the facts on the left hand side hold where those kinds of facts can be any old facts you like, essentially. Um, if you have a piece of metaphysical theory like that on the table, um, you can just feed in the facts, however strange that your physics is producing, and grounding will handle them, because grounding doesn't uh, discriminate as to which facts it allows in to be its relata. Um, that's kind of the, the idea, and if it sounds, um, sounds worryingly cheap, then Perhaps it is, but uh, that's that's the kind of thing that grounding theorists do, um, and they think this notion has widespread applications through science. Uh, maybe give uh, some more reassuring kinds of examples. Um, uh, grounding theorists would want to say, for example, that the pressure of a gas is grounded in the uh, average translational speed of the molecules, um, you know, speed up the molecules, increase the pressure. Um, and although that relationship kind of appears to go two ways, kind of change the pressure, slow down the molecules, speed up the molecules, increase the pressure, we think that it's the, it, the explanation there flows in one direction. The pressure is what it is because the molecules are doing what they're doing. The molecules aren't doing what they're doing because the pressure is as it is. So that even in that sort of situation, it seems like there's an important directionality there. And that's what grounding is meant to help us capture. So that's the kind of like toy, toy application in physics, which I think, um, you know, uh, whatever you may think of it, work, you know, works according to the model that grounding theorists want. So a slightly different kind of framework that does a lot of the same things, ultimately, is Ted Sider's notion of concept fundamentality. Um, so this, uh, the concept fundamentality is a kind of status that certain kind of pieces of vocabulary essentially can have, um, uh, whereby you know, predicates um, can be fundamental in this sense, and that what that is to say the predicate is fundamental is effectively to say that it expresses a fundamental property. Um, sentence could have uh, this feature of structurality, which is to say it expresses a fundamental fact. Um, this is meant to be like a category neutral operator that you can attach to a piece of vocabulary to signify that that vocabulary expresses something fundamental and it itself is meant to be fundamental. So, you know, the operator is structural, is itself structural on this view. Um, this is a generalization of, of David Lewis's notion of naturalness, but it's a generalization which is designed to make it more powerful and therefore able 
to handle, um, say, descriptions amongst levels of fundamentality, because naturalness um, has, uh, without going into like arcane David Lewis met metaphysics uh, mode, naturalness has significant limitations which are stripped away in concept fundamentality. And concept fundamentality is roughly as flexible as, as grounding. And I think the, Ever the Everettian can use either of these uh, approaches the metaphysicians have, have developed. Uh, in this case, they would simply say that the, uh, the universal quantum state site is a perfectly fundamental concept, whereas the concepts um, corresponding to the kind of decoherent worlds are not. Um, the, you write down a, um, um, a decoherent history space and pick out a particular decoherent history from that space. That's not fundamental, <laughs> that description on Sider's terms in the way that the, the description in terms of the universal state was. And then once you've got that, Sider has this notion of metaphysical semantics, where you say kind of what it is for something to be, that something non-fundamental to be the case in terms of the more fundamental language and you can nest and, and ramify um, in your semantics. So it's a, it's a very flexible notion. He argues even more flexible than grounding. Um, but you know, for our purposes, they have a lot more in common than they, they dis differ in because they both have these features of applying to all sorts of, of concepts, to all sorts of uh, like facts of various kinds, different vocabulary, including these unfamiliar um, types of facts and vocabulary that the Everettians present us with about the fundamental state. And both of these have the required connection to one-way supervenience. Um, if A grounds B, then A one-way supervenes on B, um, at least. Um, uh, sorry, B one-way supervenes on A, at least, um, on the standard views about grounding. Similarly, given the way that metaphysical semantics are, are construed as, as, as non-contingent, um, but let's, uh, I'll, I'll, let's we, can, we can talk about those. Um, Antonio is reminding me that, that, that time is limited. I've been talking at kind of quite a general introductory level um, for a lot of this. Um, and so now I want to flip to page two of the handout where there's a specific kind of level structure displayed. Um, and what I want to say is that this level structure, as I put it, semi-conservatively extends a classical level structure. So you may be familiar, familiar with the notion of like conservative extension in philosophy of maths, where like an axiom system kind of like kind of may like um, uh, be able to prove everything provable by some like less powerful axiom system uh, and more besides, but uh, not be able to prove anything which is provably false according to the first axiom system. Um, we have a kind of system of levels here or special science levels going down to the Everett world level, um, which it, the top two levels on my diagram, which are essentially the same. When I say essentially, they, I think they are you know, roughly the same. They are, they are um, they're similar, but not exactly the same as the kind of ordinary system of levels that we have in mind when we think of you know, scientific theories like um, economics, psychology, chemistry, biology, physics, and we kind of, we can build a like a kind of a branching structure of kind of uh, potential intersecting theoretic reductions between these theories and, and identify something like a level structure there. This is a kind of familiar, a familiar thing to attempt in philosophy of science. Um, in the everything picture, you get those levels of, of physics, chemistry, biology, and economics back, but they, uh, they are emergent in character, and this is, and they may differ across Everett worlds. And this, I think, is something that really deserves a lot more thought than has really been put in yet uh, by Everettians. How exactly different cosmological proposals play into contingency across the Everett worlds? Um, because if, as seems quite plausible, the specific kind of physics that, that goes on in our epoch of the universe um, and the chemistry and the biology that it supports is in some sense fine-tuned, that the parameters 
could very easily have been different that would not have given rise to that sort of complex structure. Then to the extent that any of those parameters are the result themselves of quantum processes, there are gonna be in an Everett multiverse, Everett worlds where those parameters take different values, there are gonna be in an Everett multiverse worlds where kind of different special science structures emerge because the physics was different. And so different special science studyable structures emerged from that physics. You'll get different complex phenomena if you have different enough underlying physics and the high sensitivity apparent the kind of fine, fine tunedness of our current physic, physical kind of environment suggests that, uh, to me at least, that there are probably Everett worlds where the level structure really looks quite different. And this would include uh, contingency in the spatiotemporal structure of those worlds. I'm not going to have time to talk about this to the extent that I wanted to. I'm, I'm sorry, I've, I've taken far too long. Blame the, um, blame the vaccine hangover. But um, Take, for example, uh, a kind of string landscape model. To the extent that like compactification of space-time in the string landscape model is a quantum process, it, in an Everettian setting, there are different Everett worlds where space-time compactifies in different ways. Um, and so to the extent that there are different kind of physical environments uh, in different Everett world where space-time is compactified in different ways, you will get different special science levels uh, in those worlds. I see no reason to think that the only possible kind of levels of the special sciences are the ones around here. The multiverse is gonna be a pretty varied place if, these if there are any of these parameters that are fixed by quantum cosmological processes. And it looks to me like they probably are. Um, and so it's unlikely that it would be kind of no complex structure anywhere except for around here. For there to be in principle a special science of. Um, so the claim is that we do get these levels of special science that we know and love back in this picture, but we only get the ones as we know and love them uh, kind of in our region of the multiverse around here, go too far away, go to worlds that branch from ours too far back in, the cos in, in, in cosmological history. You may well get worlds which uh, have you know, insofar as there's chemistry going on at all, that chemistry looks very different from our own. I think that's a, a realistic possibility. And I'm interested to hear what people think about that. So that's all I'm gonna to have to say about that, um, I'm afraid. But um, to continue this, 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 this level structure, um, the Everett world level is the next one down. And that's what I want people to kind of compare to the fundamental level of a previous physical theory. So where a previous physical theory might have had like fundamental physics and then maybe less fundamental physics and then less fundamental physics and then chemistry as a kind of type of level structure. Here, fundamental physics of a world is not the most fundamental level there are. Now the most fundamental physics at a world is uh, still less fundamental than the goings on at the level of the fundamental quantum state, the more fundamental thing. And so the fundamental level at the bottom of this diagram has been added in. It has no analog at all in classical level structures. So that's the sense in which I, was, I think it's kind of straightforward that properly interpreted an Everettian system of fundamentality and levels will extend downwards the level structure that we're used to, to the fundamental quantum state, which is no longer aptly regarded as part of our own Everett world, but as something more fundamental than it. There's a question, um, th th there's a further potential level, which is kind of the level of the set of all the worlds. And I, 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 as a metaphysician, I want to say that that is also a useful explanatory level because a lot of, I want to give a lot of metaphysical explanations at that level. I want to kind of quantify over all the worlds in the multiverse and say things like, um, you know, uh, the speed of light is constant at all these worlds, if it is, or, 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 or whatever. Um, and so I think that there's like a level in between the level of the fundamental level of our own Everett world and the fundamental state of, like, uh, of, of, of reality, um, which is an emergent level. It's a level of Wallace's emergent multiverse, all the worlds together, kind of 
um, zoom out from our own world to see all the worlds, but don't go any more fundamental than that so that all you see is one unified quantum state. Stay at the, stay at the zoom level where you see all the worlds. That's the, the level of the multiverse level that I, I have in mind here. And there's no analog of that in classical level pictures either, unless you're David Lewis and are a modal realist, in which case you do have something rather like that, though you don't um, think about it in the, quite the same sorts of ways that I'm thinking about it. Um, but the thought, kind of broadly speaking, everybody who was not like an eliminative reductionist believed in the special science levels and still can. Everybody without fail believed in the Everett world level and still can. It's just now there's some levels potentially below that that include some of the material that one might have expected to go in the Everett world level and the fundamental physics. Um, and what I'm going to say very quickly, because I don't have time to kind of walk through it, but there's not an awful lot to it, is that both grounding and content fundamentality, it seems to me, work completely fine to implement a level structure like this. Um, uh, so kind of I invite concerns about the application of those notions there. Um, and I move on to section four, uh, where I want to kind of say a little bit more about what it might mean when I said a second ago that some of what was previously thought of as being like in the fundamental physical level, uh, which is now identified as like the level of our world, might no longer be in, like correctly thought of at that level, but now thought of as the most fundamental level. In particular, I'm thought of, thinking of the quantum state and the Schrodinger equation. Um, the Schrodinger equation on this picture is not best thought of as a law of our world at all. It's thought of as a law of the fundamental level of the universal quantum state. Of course, it has implications for our world because our world is part of an emergent multiverse that's realized by the fundamental state. So kind of, we can work backwards from an application of the uh, Schrodinger equation, understanding it as a law of the fundamental level to implications for what to expect in our own world without it actually being a law of our own world. That's the idea. Um, and so I, this, is, this is now to draw on chapter four of my book, but um, I, I kind of have a taxonomy of different kinds of laws of nature there where some of what we think of as fundamental laws um, energy conservation, perhaps, uh, are laws of individual worlds in the sense that energy is conserved at every single one of them. So it is like a universal generalization true over all the worlds that energy is conserved at each one. Um, whereas another thing we might previously have wanted to think of as naively as a fundamental law, the Schrodinger equation, is something which applies at the level of the fundamental state only. And although it is you know, perfectly reasonable to use it to draw inferences about our world, those inferences are now mediated, are understood as mediated by, via the Schrodinger equation correctly describing the fundamental state and our drawing implications from our world from that. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of peculiar account of laws of nature going on here, where now that we've got two new levels, in the Everettian picture, kind of below the levels we had thought we had. Some of the laws which we located at the higher levels now kind of drop down and live more naturally at the lower levels. And that's a kind of a peculiar and perhaps unexpected kind of uh, phenomenon. So oh, I'll finish with section five. And here I want to um, uh, I want to bring in some ideas which are more specific to my own approach to everything quantum mechanics. I've described in this book, The Nature of Contingency. Uh, in that book, what I do is to connect up everything quantum mechanics with the metaphysics of modality. So I, I identify quantum theory as giving an account of what these old philosophical ideas of possibility and necessity in the world and chance in the world really are. 
Um, so the idea is that we've kind of we've known about necessity, physical necessity for a long time. Um, we've known about things you can and can't do. Um, and we haven't understood it. And we didn't really understand what it was until um, Everetti and quantum theory was on the table and we could identify contingency, um, like genuine contingency, genuine ways things could go as the different Everett worlds. So an Everett world just is a way things really can be. The kind of, the, the Everett worlds are the objective possibilities, these things we kind of had been, we kind of knew were around but we didn't really know the underlying nature of. I want to say the very same way that we knew there was water, but we didn't know what it was. We didn't know that it was H2O. Likewise, we knew that there were possi alternative possibilities. We didn't know what they were. Turns out there are other worlds just like this one, correctly described by quantum theory. That's the vision, and uh, that's what goes on in the book. And like one of the very central features of that uh, these, um, is captured by these two principles, alignment and indexicality of actuality on the handout. So alignment just says to be a possible world is to, to be a metaphysically possible world is to be an Everett world. So the Everett world corresponds to the objective possibilities in like whatever sense is most significant to metaphysics. Um, and uh, this is then the notion of actuality goes with the notion of our Everett world. Um, so it turns the view into a version of modal realism so now we understand Everett as describing all possible, all physical possibilities, rather than describing one really complicated physical possibility. Um, the question is, should we say that all the worlds are actual? This is something that Everett says in his own initial presentation of the view. He says, all the worlds are, are actual. Um, goodbye, Jeremy, thank you for, for attending. Um, and I think that's a mistake, as an understandable kind of mistake. I mean, if ever it wasn't a metaphysician, he couldn't have seen the kind of advantage of combining indexical actuality with his view. But I think there are very significant philosophical advantages uh, to doing so. Um, and once we understand Everett as a version of modal realism, we understand all the Everett worlds as alternative physical possibilities. Um, and we take it that all physical possibilities really exist. And we take it that there are no further physical possibilities. So kind of quantum mechanics applies um, necessarily. It couldn't have, couldn't have failed to apply. Um, once we once we have a picture like that, I think it's quite easy to see that the approach to uh, fundamentality in terms just of modality, just in terms of one way supervenience, isn't going to work any longer. Because the emergent multiverse for Everettians on this modalist interpretation is contingent. The whole multiverse couldn't have been any other way. Nor could the fundamental quantum state. That couldn't have been any other way either. And so there's going to be like uh, two-way supervenience between these levels, which they need to think of as uh, dif differing with respect to fundamentality if the initial defense of Everettian quantum mechanics is gonna get off the ground. And so uh, the need to be able to think of uh, the fundamental state as more fundamental than the emergent multiverse combined with a reading of uh, the Everettian approach where modality lives within the multiverse completely, just makes modality kind of off the table as a tool to understand uh, fundamental. If you're already convinced that supervenience was unexplanatory, that's not going to bother you at all um, because supervenience was already inadequate to the job. But if you're someone that thinks supervenience is all we need to characterize fundamentality, I mean, I'll argue with you, but if, if, if you do think that, then you might have some reason there to reject this, this modalized uh, version of Everett that I've described. But uh, I would say that the, the advantages, the philosophical advantages for Everettians of adopting this, this modalized version are great. Um, 
uh, their account has like huge philosophical explanatory power once you do that, and that reflects well on it, I think. Um, but that's uh, that's that's for another discussion. So um, let me let me wrap up at that point. Uh, I'll just uh, quickly conclude. I mean, the, the take-home messages are in section six. Um, uh, what we have is what I've called semi-conservative extension of an existing level structure downwards by many worlds quantum theory. We've got new levels that we didn't have before. And some of our familiar laws now look more like laws of those lower levels than they do of the more familiar levels. Um, we can understand this sort of structure using either grounding or Siderian concept fundamentality while still retaining, like, um, you know, I think perfectly respectable scientific credentials and also uh, without making trouble for my preferred modal realist interpretation of everything quantum mechanics, uh, which I think is independently appealing. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you again for your attention, uh, especially so, so close to the break. Uh, thank you all and have a good break. So the first in line is uh, Barry Lower. So uh, please, Barry, go ahead. So my question for you is this, since it's a space-time colloquium, um, I suppose that each of the worlds have their own space-time structures, and space-time structures can be very different. How do you think about the quantum state? Does it occupy some sort of a space-time structure also? I was thinking not. I mean, the quantum state has to be common to all the worlds. Um, How do you get from the quantum state to the space-time structures? Well, that's a very good question. And I want to say, I don't know because I don't know what the correct theory of quantum gravity is. I mean, the, the, the quantum state that's in question is gonna be like whatever state the correct theory of quantum gravity identifies. Um, and the uh, like space, space time structure of our world is gonna be kind of whatever emerges from the quantum, um, processes that kind of crystallize out of space time, assuming so that's- maybe it would be how to put quantum gravity aside and just think about a sort of a little, you know, simple example. Suppose that the world was actually non-quantum gravity, not even quantum field theory, just, you know, standard beginning textbook quantum mechanics. And yeah. it was a wave function in it. And the wave function was, um, uh, characterized in a particular way, I guess it occupies, it, it, it evolves over time, right? So there's some sort of temporal dimension for the wave function. Is there also a spatial? Yeah, well, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, we've got like a, a background space time. I mean, part of the big picture of the, the book is that these sorts of simplified toy models, um, it kind of doesn't matter in a sense if um, uh, some of them are, you know, we get we get peculiar outcomes when we think about what would be the case if those, if worlds like that were obtained, because it doesn't matter because those worlds just aren't genuine possibilities. I mean, the only possibility is whatever quantum gravity uh, universal state in fact is all the other quantum states are not genuine possibilities. So you can kind of think about them for kind of heuristic reasons, but it's not like you need to make sense of a world like that um, on this view. Uh, it's just not kind of incumbent on someone that like thinks that like, some particular theory of quantum gravity is actually true to be able to say a sensible thing about how things would be if, you know, if um, non-relative quantum theory were correct um, any more than um, we kind of have to be able to say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. So, um, so in other words, what you're saying to me is this, that for somebody who says, I just don't see how you can get from this quantum state, the way I think about it in, at least in standard quantum mechanics, to worlds with space-time structures, unless the quantum state itself Occupy something like a space-time structure. You're saying I can't tell you, can't tell you, I can't help you here because it's not until we have a theory of quantum gravity that I'll be able to answer a question like this. Yeah, I mean, to 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 a large extent, yeah. Um, 
I I do want to say that the same way that you know we you know we were right to plead cluelessness about the like the deep structure of matter. Um, we would have been right to plead cluelessness about the deep structure of matter four thousand years ago. We just weren't in a position to to guess about like neutrons and quarks and things like that. Well, but people could have said something then. They could have said, look, in fact, Democritus and Lucretius, I guess, did say. Look, there are these particles, you know, maybe they, they're deeper structure than particles. Right. I can right. see how when a bunch of particles Good. get together Good. in this shape, Good. we get a cat. Good. Well, yeah, I mean, they might have been like, um, like kidding themselves that they really saw that so clearly as they thought they did, actually. But um, never, never mind. Um, yeah, there was, I, I agree. Good. There, is, there are like schematic things we can try to say. So, for example, we might want to say, well, kind of whatever... Um, uh, you know, even if like whatever um, the, the fundamental state is like, whatever kind of quantum gravity object it's about, um, that uh, maybe that will be uh, defined over something like a kind of space that is not space time, but is a fundamental space, um, pre-space time or something like mm -hmm. something altogether different. Like it will identify something else. So we can like hypothesize like, will the theory of quantum gravity take the form of identifying something which isn't space time, but which is kind of relevantly like it um, and um, having like a, a field state over that or not? Um, these are different hypotheses about, and then we can kind of consider how things would go. But again, I, I guess the point I wanted to make earlier was we're kind of considering these in like the indicative mode. We're thinking physics might turn out this way, it might turn out that way. It's not like we're com committed to be able to make sense of them in the counterfactual mode, that like there's a genuine possibility it could turn out this way, we need to make sense of it. A genuine possibility it could turn out that way, we need to make sense of it. These things that are, you know, the, these hypotheses, most of them are just not going to correspond to genuine possibilities on my preferred approach. Um, I don't know whether that makes a difference. Um, so in short, we want to be able to say some schematic things um, uh, about the initial quantum state, but it will depend on like schematic features of our theory of quantum gravity. And so, you know, if we like focus on string theory, then we can start saying some things about the quantum state, what the uh, fundamental quantum state might be like. If we like, look at some different theory, we can start saying, some things about it. But until we have the actual theory, um, those will be somewhat schematic. Okay. I don't feel I'm answering the question very directly, but that's, it's, 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 a, um, it's a situation where like, kind of the views I have entail that at the moment we like have to remain substantially ignorant of some like fairly deep metaphysical, um, uh, you know, some, some fairly central features of the fundamental level. Um, okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Richard is the next. So please, Richard, go ahead. Um, I have two, two worries about, um, I guess, about uh, contingency modality more generally. Um, the, the first worry is this. Uh, we, we tend to think of quantum theory as um, an empirical theory. Uh, and a lot of people actually spend time testing quantum theory to see whether it's true or not. Um, and it, it, I have a very strong intuition that it might really be false. Um, I'm not, not saying that I believe it's false, but it, it's possible for it to be false. Uh, and I think on your view of modality, it's not really possible for it to be false. Um, and that worries me a lot uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm losing contact with your notion of, of real possibility if it's not really possible for quantum theory to be false. Um, shall yeah. I give you the second question or do you want to... Uh, let's, let, 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 let's go with that. So my notion of real possibility is, 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 is not that far off kind of non-zero chance um, uh, at the beginning of time. That's a kind of rough um, characterization of it. Um, so, uh, you know, anything that could have, anything that it would ever the case that it could have happened, that's a, that, that is going to be, I'm going to have a possibility for that. But completely different theories that right now we take seriously, 
Um, yes, I don't think we need to say they correspond to any objective possibility. I, I've made the connection in the past with the situation in mathematics. So, um, you know, we may be genuinely uncertain whether some uh, axiom uh, system is uh, consistent or not. And, you know, we have a theory that it is and a theory that it isn't. And we're going to find out sooner or later which one it is, perhaps. But um, uh, once we do, we'll find out that the hypothesis the other hypothesis would necessarily false. So the scenario is kind of like that. We're, we, 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 these are both open physical possibilities. Sorry, these are both open like possibilities to us in the sense of open epistemic possibilities that right. for all we know might turn out to be so. But they only one of them is a genuine possibility, and it's the same way as like if the you know we've got a die that is um, uh, biased um, uh, to always land heads or always land tails. Um, uh, but we, we only know which way it's biased. You know, we don't have any knowledge of which way it's biased. So it's yes. 50, 50 which way it will land. Nonetheless, we know that it will definitely land one of the ways every time. Um, mm -hmm. We just don't know which it is. And then that's like how we are with these physical theories. We know that there's one theory which like describes the universe every time. Um, we just don't know which one it is. What, what, doesn't, doesn't this do you mean that when people are testing quantum theory uh, and, and uh, consider it in some sense, a live possibility that the theory is false. Um, they are also testing metaphysics. Uh, so this is now experimental metaphysics. Well, yeah, so, so, so um, I mean, I, obviously I do think that uh, one can still test quantum theory this, on this approach. And there are like, there are like interesting questions about whether you can, um, but because there's a sense in which you, you, you predict with certainty that all possible observations will be made somewhere. Doesn't that trivialize confirmation? So, you know, there are, there are genuine questions about whether confirmation works in the Everettian setting. I've argued, I've argued it does. But yeah, given, give, you know, granting that you can have confirmation of that kind, um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm kind of quite happy with that way. Uh, okay. Uh, Okay, I have a second question, but I don't want to hog the discussion. So. You can ask that, that if you want. Go ahead. Okay, um, this is something that's worried me for, for quite a while, um, and it, it bears on the issue of actuality. Um, I, I see the structure of your um, uh, the notion of actuality in your view, um, but when you told us what it was, you used the word inhabitant. Um, and that's where my worry is. I'm not sure what it is to be an inhabitant of an Everettian world. Um, more, more concretely, the way we ordinarily think, there were a certain number of participants in this Zoom session when it began, and maybe there's a slightly different number now because some have left and some have joined. Um, but uh, those of us who have stayed with it throughout think we are the same individuals in the same world as each other. Um, and uh, there must be some ways of uh, uh, making fine-grained or uh, more coarse-grained divisions of Everettian worlds and the multiverse according to which that's false. Certainly, enormous numbers of, of, um, of splitting events have occurred during this Zoom session someplace. Um, so, so am I the same individual uh, as I was at the beginning, um, yeah. um, or have I split into several individuals? Uh, what about everybody else? Are, are we all inhabitants of the same Everettian yeah. world? So, um, I mean, I, 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 this is a, a breakdown of my uh, presentation because that is a that is a big part of the way I'm thinking about this. Yes, um, you, me, everybody in, in this room, everyone that's been in the Zoom room at any stage, everybody uh, else at any space of time, any space of temporal relationship r relation to us in is all in the same world. Um, uh, and the way I think about these is as non-overlapping. Non so they're, they're, they're parallel worlds. I mean, physicists use the phrase parallel world and, uh, and, and splitting worlds, branching worlds, kind of indistinguishably yes. without like noting that there's quite a significant like kind of visual at least difference between worlds that are like parallel all the yes. way along and worlds that split and i'm thinking of things in the in in, in the parallel i mean i, I have okay. some arguments maybe the arguments could be stronger that, that the parallel um uh model is legitimate the argument for the parallel model is actually a somewhat pragmatic one it's to do with that um it's the metaphysics which gives you by far the best account of probability um mm -hmm. uh 
And like okay. so this ability in the theory of probability is kind of enough ground on kind of like holistic Quinean best system of the world kind of grounds to build in the metaphysics of divergence. Mm -hmm. Um, that is a parallel world. So that's kind of one of the more out there parts of the book. And that's the, the respect in which I probably disagree with most. That's the respect in which my disagreements with other Everettians are most significant. Yeah. Um, so other Everettians, some of them lean into the splitting imagery. Some of them try to um, kind of deflate the question of splitting versus parallel worlds completely mm -hmm. David Wallace says it's like a basically a metaphysical pseudo question whether the mm -hmm. world are parallel or split mm -hmm. um, which is a kind of radical anti-metaphysics kind of position that are, you know is not kind of exactly going to make the um, view seem more palatable to a, a general philosophical audience um, uh, saying that you know there's no fact of the matter about whether we've got parallel or splitting worlds here seems like a, a hard thing to get your head around um, my view is that there's a kind of, you know, the best way to think about this stuff is in terms of parallel worlds. Okay, um, so, so, so we've all been in the same parallel world throughout the Zoom session. Absolutely, and we always will be uh, together. We, we, we kind of, you know, there's kind of in-world solidarity here. <laughs> um, what we have, what, what, what we have, though, of course, is innumerable other Zoom sessions that will proceed in every respect identically to this one. But uh -huh. the inhabitants of that Zoom session We'll go on to different futures. Um, Even though up until now, um, I, I, I have doppelgangers with identical pasts. Yeah, so, it's, so there's lots of doppelgangers this way, lots more okay. extra doppelgangers prior to what we would think of as the splitting events. Um, but we, okay. we, we are kind of exchanging even more events, so to speak, for a much more like smooth and simple interpretation of probability. That's the... Uh, that's the oh, I see. That's okay, the thank you. It's just, yeah, I mean, once you've got Everettians, you've got a lot of events already. So kind of adding a few more segments that are the same kind of things you already got seems like not much of a, you know, a cost when, uh, if, if you are, if you're getting a significant explanatory benefit out, that's the, that's the kind of reasoning. Thank you. Cheers. Many thanks. Next in line, we have uh, Aaron. Please go ahead. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Oh, okay. Um, the the last few questions and answers have uh, triggered some thoughts that relate to discussions uh, you and I Al, have had in the past. Uh, but I think there's there's something that new that's emerged, um, which has to do with uh, whether there is a complete set of possibilities that somehow coexists all the time, or whether the possibilities that are significant that we need to think about as scientists, engineers, and whatever are branching. And at particular uh, points along a branch, new kinds of branches can emerge that couldn't, couldn't have emerged along other branches. And it seems very clear that that's the case with, uh, for example, um, the history of technology on this planet. There are all sorts of things that are now possible uh, because of the technology we've got that just were not possible a century ago or even a couple of decades ago. And there might be other things that are possible on, in some other part of the universe that are not possible here. So uh, I wonder to what extent that is just something that fits into the Everettian schema. Uh, it would, uh, because it has a mathematical structure that I hadn't taken in, or whether it needs to be extended to allow for these branching possibilities. And the most spectacular examples all now come out of computer science and the application of computers where new branching possibilities almost seem to emerge every day. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. So I, I, the, I mean, I definitely want every possibility that is uh, a possible outcome of your envisaged branching new possibilities to be part of the multiverse. Um, and whether those possibilities are there, um, like kind of timelessly or not, I think is perhaps a bit of a red herring in the sense that um, like from the, from the point of view of the whole multiverse, um, and the kind of 
look at all the worlds arrayed alongside together, that's a timeless point of view. That object, a multiverse of ever at world, does not change. Um, change is something that is it, that, that happens inside a world. Um, and in the sense that, like, the possibilities that are accessible uh, with, to, to, to agents within worlds, like, like effective uh, strategies available to those agents, um, those sorts of things do change over time with respect to the in-world time. Um, so I think I would want to say, like, to the extent that anything changes and emerges and does, comes to exist that didn't previously exist, kind of localized possibilities of the kind you're talking about can. But like there is a larger and broader thing like the, the multiverse, which kind of encompasses all of those possibilities and that thing doesn't emerge. Um, again, I would want to kind of contrast the like the multiverse level of description where there's no contingency um, because we couldn't have had a different multiverse on this view with the in-world level where things are contingent because um, that, broadly speaking, because there are worlds just like ours that match up to some point and differ thereafter. Like that's kind of what it is for things to possibly be different on this, this view. Um, and so all in all, um, I do think that, I, that, that the picture I have in mind accommodates um, change and emergence of kind of possibilities for phenomena in localized regions of localized worlds. But that is against the kind of backdrop of like all of those things being made possible as if at once from the kind of timeless point of view um, by whatever gives rise to the, the multiverse. Um, so I would want to say that like uh, what you're describing is an apt description of what's going on from the in world point of view, but there is also the existence of this kind of additional complementary point of view where all the possibilities are already folded in. And that could perhaps mean that in order to describe this more fundamental uh, space of possibilities, we need a rich language with a rich ontology that allows the expression of all these different kinds of branching possibilities to be to be specified yeah. and maybe that, that wasn't thought of by Everett but it has to be added no. to well I mean I, I mean that it needs to be that you can do justice to the richness of say uh chemistry um if everything quantum mechanics just necessarily entailed a kind of eliminative reductionism whereas all there were were wave functions and there were no people there were no tables that sort of real eliminative risk reduction, that's not, I think, a view. If ever it, for some reason, kind of forced you down that route, that would be bad. Um, because there are people, there are tables, that's that's a given. Um, uh, and like, of course, like sophisticated Everettians are not, they, they, they want the fact that fundamentally they're just the quantum state to coexist with, there are tables and there are people. Um, and that, so that's, that's kind of part of what this, uh, th th this contrasting of levels of description is meant to achieve. And there are all the thoughts that people could have had but haven't had or perhaps will have in some future state but haven't had yet and all of those already exist in the Everettian. Well already in the sense of timeless already. Already in the sense of like not comparably with respect to time from here they exist. That timelessly they exist. That's not to say that they exist by now. Um, if, but yeah, I I think we agree. Okay, thank you. Next in line, we have uh, Joanna. Please go ahead, Joanna. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about a detail of your view, namely, um, why do you think that uh, individual Everett worlds are less fundamental? Uh, than the multiverse. Uh, yeah. Isn't the multiverse just a collection of uh, Everett worlds? Very good question. Yes, thank you for this. This is something I wanted to talk about that I plan to talk about. I did talk about the last time I presented this paper, but I ran out of time and I just skipped today. Um, you're completely right. Uh, it is a very natural thing to want to do, I think, to fold together what I'm calling the Everett world level and the multiverse level. 
um, so that uh, you just think of kind of um, the multiverse level as like the real level here and the Everett world are just parts of that, but not constituting le new levels by themselves. And the reason I, I, I prefer to actually think of these individual worlds as, as constituting new levels is because I do think that like, there's a significant change uh, when one uh, associated with the kind of world bound perspective that can be captured by identifying the individual Everett world as a new level. Um, it's not just, I, I guess I want to say that the individual Everett world level is like, you specify the multiverse um, and then some part of it. The Everett world level is meant to be kind of embodied in that world and the level of a description as from within that world. So it kind of builds in a certain like self-location into the level. And that's an unfamiliar idea. And one reason I think I like the CIDR approach, the metaphysical semantics, is because um, it's quite natural on that approach to say that the kind of um, the indexical that locates yourself as this is my world, uh, the metaphysical semantics allow, the CIDR approach allows for that indexical kind of here to be an objective, like, uh, a fundamental piece of vocabulary or a relatively fundamental piece of vocabulary. And so specifying like a location, like can be a, a physically objective uh, feature on that approach. This is a very unfamiliar approach, I think, to a lot of people and a lot of metaphysicians aren't gonna like it either. A simpler approach is just to say, the multiverse level and the Everett world level are the same level. And all we need is to add a you are here marker to say which world we're in, and that can be thought of as purely representational, not metaphysical. It's just a matter of language. And then there's a question of whether we can really give all the explanations that we want to do, give about kind of involving what I think of as a really world-bound phenomenon. Like I think of things like causation as something that happens within a world only. Um, and so there are lots of phenomena that I think are only kind of, they only go on in the in-world level. And it's natural um, and having a, like a level for each individual world, it'll be the level where those phenomena start to make sense, seems a natural thing. But it would be a more austere view, a less metaphysically rich view, a more kind of, something that does more with like philosophy of language and less with metaphysics to just use to, to merge those two levels together and use like linguistic indexicals um, instead of metaphysical uh, you are here markers. It's whether the kind of you are here marker is a, is a linguistic item or a metaphysically significant item. I think that's kind of the best way to think about it. And this is, I, I, I wanna say, this is a really good question. You've, um, this is like one of the most like delicate parts of the paper and the one that I'm least sure about. And I feel like there ought to be a special level for individual Everett worlds, given their explanatory importance, but I'm not really sure uh, about how best to argue for that still, as you've probably guessed from the way I've been kind of waving my hands around a lot. So thank you again for the question. Thank you. Next, we have Matt. Hi, can you okay. see and hear me? I can. Hi, um, great. Thank you for this very interesting talk. I want to ask, a very general question about your framework because I haven't read your book. Um, you said that um, you said that in in your view um, that the Everettian worlds um, are the physically possible worlds, and it seems to me that you know if Everettian quantum mechanics is true, then it follows straightforwardly that the Everettian worlds are identically the the physically possible worlds. Um, or, well, I mean, uh, do you mean ever multiverses are the physically possible worlds or the individual worlds within the multiverses are the physically possible worlds? Because the standard view, a view that Tim Maudlin says is like, how could you possibly doubt it? In a footnote to his book, says like the model of a physical theory corresponds to exactly one possible world. And like, I want to say models of everything quantum mechanics contain lots of worlds. Um, so I'm denying the thought that like each model of the total physical theory corresponds one one with a possible world 
I want to say that that, print, that bridge principle, models of physical theories correspond one one with possible worlds, is something that should be open to revision in the case of unexpected physics, um, like ever. I'm sorry, I, don't, I, I kind of interrupted the question, but I don't know if that that preempted. Yeah, okay, your so I mean that that certainly adds something. So um, right, but okay, so but on. So your view then is that the physical, the physically possible worlds correspond to those that are physically possible given the initial state of, given a quantum mechanics and be the initial state of the quantum wave function, right? But even then that wouldn't be, I mean, in a sense, yes, but like that, that's also compatible with the view where there's exactly one physically possible world and it's our ever at multiverse. Like one, if you just like took the standard view according to which like there are a lot of physically possible, there are lots of like different possible worlds with different physics, and, like some of them are Newtonian and some of them are GRW and some of them are Everett, then you would have loads of branches, loads of Everett worlds all in one single metaphysically possible world in the Everett scenario. Yeah. And I'm yeah. saying like, if Everett, Everett turns out to be correct, we should junk that whole picture where you've got some GRW worlds, some uh, Newtonian worlds, some Everett worlds containing a lot of branches and just say every world corresponds one to one with an Everett world. That's what possibility is, big surprise. Um, uh, or, or, there aren't after all any of these GRW worlds. Um, yeah, okay, well then let, let me just ask the short question like what justifies identifying Everett worlds with metaphysically possible worlds yeah so it's a kind of like part of it is the kind of david lewis like argument from theoretical usefulness it simplifies overall metaphysical theory um, I, I think of it in like kind of quinean terms like what you're looking at metaphysics and it's like i'm interested in suppose that the physics you're putting in is something basically everettian what's the best metaphysics to combine with it to get the best overall like physics metaphysics package deal out at the end and I don't think the best metaphysics to combine with ever to get a package deal is the best metaphysics to combine with say Newtonian mechanics to get the best package deal there. Like if Newtonian mechanics had turned out to be true, I think per impossibile, but just like imagine, um, uh, then you know we would have been right in maybe like having a subantivalist um, meta space metaphysics or something, you know. Um, but you know it didn't turn out that way. That's not the right metaphysics. Instead, the right metaphysics is like the Everett-friendly metaphysics, and that's one that doesn't make room for any other any non-Everett possibilities. So we junk them. That's the argument. And again, it's it's it's, it's kind of in, in extension in the in extenso in the book. But I mean, most people think well, like there's a big cost here, which is that it makes fundamental physics non-contingent, and obviously fundamental physics could have been different. And I just want to say, where did you get that assumption from? Why is that obvious? You can imagine it being different. Um, but, you know, what you can imagine is not a very good guide to the possibilities. Um, you know, only if, like, uh, possibility was a purely conceptual matter would what you imagine be a reliable guide to it. But it's not. It's a like, metaphysical, objective matter, what's really possible. And um, it's appropriate for physics to be our guide to what's really possible more than it is imaginings to be our guide to what's really possible. That's the kind of, like, a kind of... I want to say that like, the, the view that the laws of nature are non-contingent at the fundamental level is actually quite plausible if ever at stuff. Um, and that you know, there's too swift a move from the epistemic possibility of other physics to the genuine possibility of other physics made usually. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Pedro. So it's just a more physical question, but just to to get your frame right. I mean, um, what's the role of uh, decoherence in your frame? Okay, let me phrase it uh, more accurately because uh, I mean, I've always found unconvincing. I mean, the, the, the arguments that people claim that decoherence picks up a unique basis. I don't think that's true. Actually what decoherence does is basically, okay, you have your either wave function or density matrix. And okay, the off diagonal elements do indeed increase exponentially compared to the diagonal ones. But that by no means select a unique basis. It only just uh, in any, in an arbitrary basis, you get that uh, 
phenomenon. And this is basically what people in the decoherence camp argue for instead basically to, to claim for the transition for the quantum to the classical uh, world. So basic in your framework, okay, not only do you have the multiverse, but only within each branch, you have this uh, variety of uh, different bases. And unless you come up with some external uh, extra motivation to basically prefer a basis, you end up with uh, these uh, uh, choices. So I must admit that basically I'm not uh, basically aware of uh, state of the art in, in, in effort quantum mechanics or so perhaps, uh, but to my best of knowledge, I mean, there is no compelling reason to, to basically pick a unique basis. So I, I don't know whether in your metaphysical framework you've addressed that uh, issue or you just basically kind of buy what uh, basically yeah. People from theoretical physics think so. Yeah, so I'm um, so this is not my area of expertise, alas, and um, you know I, I no, hope but but I have good enough but grip. My, my, my question is, so we'll try, but let, let let me try. Um, I mean, Wallace sees the uh, non fundamentality of the Everett worlds as the key, uh, and Saunders too, as a key to understanding how it can be that um. It's true that there is a multiverse of Everett worlds, even without an exact decoherent basis. Um, because what they say is it's okay um, for you know there to be quite a bit of indeterminacy in that world, as long as there's like enough determinate in sorry, in the in the uh, which precise decoherence, uh, which precise basis we select. Um, uh, there's quite a lot of flexibility there. Um, it's like all of the choices that are plausible choices will get us that there are like some worlds where the particle is measured spin up and some worlds where the particle is measured spin down. And they'll agree about the relative weights of those worlds. They might disagree about how many worlds there are in each set, but that won't matter. What matters is that you agree that there's some worlds with this outcome, some worlds with that outcome, and the, the relative weights work out correctly. And all of what the, the like extra things you might want to say about the world that one would get from having a precise uh, basis picked out by decoherence, one just like gives up on saying them. One and and so that's that's linked to what I'm I'm saying on the first page of my handout when I, I I'm saying that um, uh, the the fundamental derivative theory plays the role in justifying the use of decoherence theory and modeling. The idea is that like decoherence theory would need to be precise if the Everett worlds were fundamental ontology, but they're not, and so it doesn't. And so it's okay that it should have this precision, this, this imprecision, as long as this imprecision isn't complete. Like it needs to be that there's determinately more than, there's determinately some worlds that are where, you know, the particle is measured that's been up and determinately somewhere it's measured and spin down and determinately that their collective weights of these ones and the collective weights of these ones adds to the right amounts. Those facts need to be determinate because those are the, like the ones that we're using to do physics. That's the kind of idea. Um, whereas the one, the facts about how many worlds are coming out of a given measurement interaction, like, or like kind of how many worlds are needed to model it, we never need to answer that question to like make physical predictions or give physics explanations. That's the idea. Um, and so these questions, which decoherence doesn't succeed in answering for us, we just like, uh, throw up our hands and say we don't need to answer them, and then we plead non fundamentality when we're challenged as to why. Um, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not fully endorsed. I mean, I, I want to describe that line of reasoning. I don't want to fully, full throatedly endorse it. I am to some extent working kind of if that works out, let's think through the philosophical consequences of it. But you know, this is something that this is a kind of approach that David Wallace, Simon Saunders, Hilary Greaves, and Co. have convinced a lot of people uh, is 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 sufficient to solve the ontology problem. I think quite a few people got convinced that this solution to the ontology problem was okay. Wherever it gets stuck is with probability. Um, and actually, I tend to think that like the probability side of things is in good shape. 
um, because it's on the kind of grounds that it's no worse off than the probability in classical physics. Um, but uh, it's the ontology side of it where things are going to fall down, if anywhere, because of the uh, imprecision of decoherence. Simon Saunders has a new paper where he, he talks about precision and imprecision in the decoherence basis. And I haven't studied that in detail, but it may be that there's actually a, uh, an innovation there that would, uh, that would permit some progress. I need to look at that. Okay, I'll, I'll have a look at it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your remarks. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, thank you. Let's return to Johan. Um, thanks. Um, I'm wondering whether um, this fact that you mentioned that um, Everettian worlds uh, don't have precise individuation condition, whether this could be a problem for uh, the model interpretation uh, or at least some challenge, uh, when the reason is that um, one might think that um, the standard model logic presupposes that um, that uh, the words, possible words, have uh, are precisely individuated. And uh, if so, then uh, perhaps in this context, one would need some non-standard model logic. Uh, what do you think about this? Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, this is a this is this is a good and difficult question. Um, what I say in my book about modal logic is something fairly deflationary about it. I don't. Um, I guess I'm like David Lewis um, and Quine in being kind of suspicious of a kind of special purpose modal logic that is just like for mo you know, applies to modality alone. Um, rather, we should have like logic being topic neutral. Um, and so we have one logic that applies everywhere. That's kind of a lot of the motivation for Lewis's modal realism. You know, you have counterpart theory and you kind of recapture modal logic, but not as a fundamental level of description of the world. In the same way, that's kind of what I'm doing. Um, I want to say we can kind of recapture the reasoning patterns that modal logic um, gives us, but without having to take it to be kind of like the fundamental logic of the modal aspects of the world, we can just say, here's how things are with respect to the multiverse. And then give an account of um, modal claims that has them, uh, certain inference patterns between them supported, um, so the modal logic kind of falls out of assumptions one makes about counterparthood amongst the worlds and about individuals in the worlds. That's the picture. Um, so although I do end up endorsing something like S5 modal logic, it falls out as not like a fundamental assumption about reality, that reality has the S5 modal logic, but like, you know, kind of, first of all, tell, tell us what the, the multiverse is like then like give an account of counterpart theory in terms of objects within the multiverse and then show how the translations are such that the support the s5 style inferences all of that work i've really borrowed from key and door who did some fantastic i think still unpublished work um uh about 10 years ago on this stuff um uh that's how i borrow it in the book so in short um, I, mean, I do think this is a good question. I do think what you describe is a reason not to say, um, and like as a fundamental fact, S5 is the correct modal logic for our world. Because modality becomes emergent along with the multiverse in my picture. Um, and like at the fundamental level, everything is, is, is necessary. Um, so like modal logical patterns of inference only apply to, you know, um, uh, at, at the level of the non-fundamental stuff. So I don't think we're any worse off because we've made, we've given the multiverse and modal interpretation than we were just with these kind of threats that we've been talking about, about whether decoherence really does deliver a satisfactory ontology. I think the question is whether decoherence gives us a satisfactory ontology. And if we can do that, I think we can modalize without 
problem as long as we're prepared to like be more deflationary about modality. It's not a fundamental feature of the world. Um, fundamentally, there's no contingency. Contingency is a matter of where we are in the multiverse, but the multiverse itself is not contingent. That is like, you know, modality doesn't run as deep as we thought it did. Contingency doesn't run as deep as we thought it did. And so it's kind of okay that like, which modal logic is correct uh, is not a fundamental fact either. Um, I mean, the, the way it falls out of the picture, and just let me say what, this one last thing. Um, for like, subject matters which aren't self-locating amongst the world, so it's not a matter of which world you're in, like claims about which world there are, for example. For those claims, all the modal statuses like collapse. So to be true is just to be possible, which is just to be necessary. And to be false is to be impossible. And uh, like there's, there's, there's just the, the truth at the fundamental level, which are all both possible and necessary. And there's the falsehoods, none of which are possible or necessary. Um, and so kind of truth goes with necessity at the fundamental level. Um, but it only comes apart from necessity when you're considering centered propositions about the world. So like, the multiverse is like this, is both true and necessary, and it comes to the same thing. But like, I'm giving a talk is true, but not necessary. So it's only with non-fundamental things that those two things come apart. At a fundamental level, those things just kind of go together. There's a lot to get your head around. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's it's a it, it's quite a kind of complicated picture. But to, yeah, to, I mean, this is kind of to come back to something that somebody else said earlier. Physics and metaphysics like aren't just aren't clearly separated anymore. Um, this is a you know lots of questions like kind of what are possibilities. On this view, they're metaphysical questions, but they're also physical questions. Um, uh, th this is these are areas where just metaphysics and physics like just overlap. Um, uh, it's not that I'm drawing the distinction between metaphysics and physics in a weirdly different place. I'm allowing them to just just overlap uh, a lot. That, that that became somewhat rambling. I hope I hope it was uh, informative at least. Okay, uh, Matt. Hi. Thanks. Yeah. So kind of along that line, I just want to I just kind of want to poke you again about the the identification of of physical and metaphysical possibility, or or if you like the the lack of a clear boundary there. It, so it seems to me that you know you raise this question. Well, you know, just because we can conceive of something, whatever made us think that 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 makes it possible. But it, it seems to me that that we do also want to have a notion of conceptual possibility, and that there's kind of a history of confusion um, in metaphysics about whether about whether metaphysical possibility is supposed to correspond to um merely logical possibility or what's uh, or logically possible worlds where uh, logical possibility is also constrained by some kind of referential semantics um but the so i guess the question is don't we still need a concept of what's uh what's logically or conceptually possible um, and then don't we need a, another sort of mod uh, modal semantics to go alongside your metaphysics in order to account for, in order to give us an account of, of conceptual possibility? Maybe, maybe we do. I mean, I'm not, it's not like what I'm in, what I'm kind of uh, like committed to favoring is something like a, um, Sorry, I'm a momentary blank. Um, what I'm committed to favoring is something like the view that uh, if there is such a modality, it's, it's like derivative. Um, uh, there are various ways in which you can imagine such a modality being derivative. For example, you could uh, identify what is conceivable with um, everything that is in fact conceived by some physically possible object in some ever in, in, in the Everett multiverse. And then like, you know, the conceivable, you know, 
you know, uh, you have a, a modality that's linked to conceivability in that sense, where conceivability is like taken really seriously as genuinely possibly conceived. Um, uh, but I mean, there, are, there, there is precedent for this sort of thing, um, not least because people want to do reasoning about mathematical and logical impossibilities. And so already there's like the need for, even if you're like a, like a kind of orthodox possible world theorist, you think lots of different physics are possible, but you don't think lots of different mathematics is a possible. You need like a special semantics for reasoning about mathematical uncertainty, representing mathematical uncertainty. And uh, so I, I guess I'm putting some, you know, whatever way we've got of reasoning about uncertainty about non-contingent matters of fact, we handle reasoning about fundamental physics that same way. Um, it, it turns out that when we reason about fundamental physics, like when we reason about mass, we're not actually trying to work out which of two genuinely possible ways for things to be obtains. We're trying to work out which of two candidates for being genuinely possible is actually genuinely possible. Um, and that does involve like quite a bit of rethinking of, of like what the scientific project is like and the relation, but you know, it's not a matter of like taking some wider set of possible worlds and then narrowing it down by doing physics. Um, like the most objective set of possible worlds is the one we get out of physics. And then like we can restrict downwards by talking about like, you know, those worlds that also obey the laws, for example, uh, but sorry, also obey like you know, legal system laws. So we can like consider like restrictions of those, like, you know, all the Everett world where people obey the laws. <laughs> um, uh, but we can also consider the kind of like modality we can construct out of the base set in the way I just kind of described with conceivability. So, you know, with ordinary modal metaphysics, we, again, we've got like the base set of worlds thought of as the metaphysical possibilities, which we might both restrict to get things like physical possibility and expand to model mathematical uncertainty. And I'm just saying we've got a different base set of worlds that we can in the same way both restrict to model some things and expand to model others. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. Um, I have a recent paper in, um, maybe you saw it, the counter possible reasoning in physics in uh, philosophy of science. Um, and that discusses like defends the compatibility of physical, of like discovery in physics with non-contingency of the fundamental laws. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Mary. Hi, Alistair. Antonio said we had some more time. So I thought I'd bother you a little bit more about what was in my mind. I mean, here's what I was yeah. thinking. I've seen your comment written down actually, Barry. So, uh, it, okay. You to... Yeah, so you can just read, well, well, maybe I should just say it so other people yeah, can, go on. can read it too. Uh, I mean, you, you um, spent the, some time at the beginning of your talk trying to give an, giving an account of what the relationship is between the different levels, what the relationship is between the quantum state and the emergent worlds and, and what's going on in our world. And you chose grounding and grounding is supposed to be an explanatory relation. Um, so it'd be nice to see some real explanations of how something which plays the role of a quantum state can explain how why it is that my cat is now wanting me to go feed him or whatever, I'm joking about that one, but you, you understand what I mean. Yeah. And it's very difficult to see how you can get any explanations of, the, of ordinary macroscopic phenomena without having an account of the uh, um, emergence of space and time. I don't know, I, I wanna say, yeah, absolutely. We haven't got any complete, complete account of that without like, there's a big gap in it, as long as we don't know how space and time fit in. But like quite often we're used to that sort of thing where we have like, an explanatory story which has some black boxes in it uh, and we trust that there is some kind of explanatory deeper explanatory story that we could replace that black box with after fur suitable further investigation we don't doubt that there's some kind of explanatory connection there um, and i just think that that's kind of the scenario we're in here um, you know yes we have to at a certain um, uh, you know as scientific realists we have to take it on trust to think that there is like a correct account of quantum gravity um, out of which our uh, like more familiar standard model physics um, emerges as an effective theory. Um, yes. And uh, that um, whatever it is, 
that thing does indirectly through an incredibly long chain of explanations um, explain the goings on of the cats and the dogs. Yeah. And we can give like lots of links in that chain. There will still be some links in that chain which are like have a big question mark. They're black boxes. Um, but like I don't think we've got any reason to think that no nothing could in principle be put in there to fill that gap. That I wasn't giving an argument that nothing in principle could be put in there. But well, that's a comparison. The question is whether it'll fit in with ever with the Everettian picture. Compare, for example, with Bohmian mechan quantum mechanics. In Bohmian quantum mechanics, there's more to the ontology. And so you can give, there's a, a story that can be told about how it is that things, something occupying space and time, particles occupying space and time and moving around in various ways can result in cats running around. Yeah. And in, in Everett, the question is, where does that exactly does that come from? I mean, yeah. you know, you're, you're right that some people like David Wallace think that this ontic structure realism provides an answer. Other people, I guess I'm one, and I guess Tim Maudland is another, think that that's not so. Yeah, so I guess I have, I mean, I'm, I, I don't think I'm gonna uh, satisfy you. This is, a, this, is a, this is an old dispute, but um, I, I confess I'm more, I'm more on David Wallace's side, mm -hmm. so I'm not as inclined as him to le lean on um, ontic structural realism to, to underwrite that position. Um, so the, the kind of bridge principle that says when you've got the boat that bridge trip that Bohmians like, when you've got particles in such and such configuration, then you've got a tiger. Um, I think those bridge principles are far more problematic than um, Bohmians like to admit. And, and it's more exactly why it, it's more than just having the particles in the position. It's the right. particles moving around and the counterfactuals and so on. But now why why do you say that? Right. So so good. So so when you include like um, all of those other aspects of the mm. particles, but I, I I mean I think a lot of the the appeal of the view is the thought that actually all you need is the shape of the particles. And I mean, you know sophisticated Bohmians like you aren't saying that, but I think a lot of people are thinking that Bohm is uh especially appealing in this respect because they really are thinking that all you need is the particles in the right spatial configuration um and um I th so i think that's a, some, somewhat a, an illusion that some people are laboring yes. under and when you kind of look at what like the bohemian actually needs to say in terms of bridge principle of um bridge, bridge principles between uh what's going on with the ontology and what's going on at the macro level, those principles look less commonsensical and more theoretical. And I'm I think I would grant that the like Everettian versions of these bridge principles are like more theoretical and less commonsensical still. But I guess I don't see that as a fatal problem because um, I, uh, yeah, I, I would, again, I would see it as a problem if I thought there had been an argument that no possible Everettian bridge principle could cross these gaps. And maybe maybe Tim more than does take himself to have given such arguments um, in some of his pieces from like ten years ago or so, a review of Wallace, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I, I mean, even though I don't think ontic structural realism is the last word on the topic, I'm kind of prepared to grant that there's like a, an explanation schema that still needs to be filled in, and remain relatively optimistic that to play it with the right quantum gravity information and that that will fill out. And I don't think- I, I guess I just want, I didn't think, think of this as being fatal. And I'm not sure that Tim yeah. thinks it that way, that way either, I don't know. But um, I just wanted to put it on the table as really a worry that one has, particularly when one's thinking of the relationship between the less and the more fundamental as an explanatory relation. Sure. I, okay, so put it this way. I think if the Wallace program, um, the kind of thought as well as program of um, like decoherent world ontology out of pure wave function can be vindicated, then it will have the appropriate explanatory power. Um, like, I don't think there's a scenario in which you're going to have like those guys having been able to forge a link, but it like fall down because it's not an explanatory link. I think if they can get their link to work at all, it will be an absolutely explanatory link. The question is whether that link that link works. And I do think that the of the, the, the jury is still out. I, I take it very seriously, for example, the kind of um uh kind of circularity kind of things, like you know, 
presupposes and uh, the, the Everettian decoherence based solutions to the preferred basis mm -hmm. problem presuppose probability and probability presupposes a um, solution to that problem. That That is the kind of worry that I take seriously. I'm not sure Wallace has really done enough to, to respond to, mm -hmm. but like, if that Wallace like style position can be vindicated, I don't think it not being unexplanatory is going to be is going to be where it fin finally falls out. Yeah, like you say, the jury is still out. I think it'll like because it's philosophy, it'll be a hung jury for sure. Yeah. Anyway, see you, Alistair. Yeah, thanks, Barry, and thanks, Richard. Uh, I see. This, in some sense, links to what you were discussing with Barry. Um, so, as you know, um, I, I think that uh, if we look at uh, fundamental physics, uh, uh, we get the hint uh, that uh, uh, you know garden variety dependence relations uh, might not be uh, sufficient uh, to uh, let's say do the job of uh, giving a, a clear uh, construction on, on what's uh, going on uh, uh, from the point of view of the de dependence relations. So, uh, do you think that? Uh, uh, Adopting, uh, let's see, a, a more uh, exotic view of or a more exotic taxonomy of dependence relations uh, can help you in making sense of your construction uh, instead of just focusing on grounding. Uh, yeah, so potentially. I mean, really, what I was doing here was more of a kind of um, it was kind of a proof of co I mean, proof of concept. I mean. Um, kind of demonstration of possibility like I want to show like here's the job description here's the metaphysical notions and you know it looks like you know th they, they are up to that job I wasn't arguing that there weren't others they weren't arguing that there weren't others that wouldn't be in some sense better and there's like there's a hint in what I say that like to prefer the metaphysical semantics approach to the grounding approach um because of the idea that um uh like indexical items of vocabulary might be counted as fundamental and that might help with that side of things i'm really not sure um uh about that though because it seems like grounding can also handle that kind of thing if one just in introduce the notion of a kind of an indexical fact uh that is apt to be grounded um, which is kind of analogous to regarding the indexical vocabulary as structure, structural inside a sense. So I think a lot, once you have like a powerful enough notion like grounding or concept fundamentality, a lot of the same kind of moves can be made with respect to each of them. So I'm not sure there's going to be like decisive reason to prefer one or the other. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm enough of a metaphysician to think that it may be that there's like actually like kind of you know, philosophical mathematical reasons to pick one if, if it turns out that they're equally good at understanding the relevant fundamental physics then our reasons for preferring them might be you know reasons of like um uh, simplicity at the like philosophical mathematical level for preferring one of these accounts of fundamentality so i'm not kind of like saying that like, it has to be physics and aptness for physics which um selects between these different notions um but the fit for physics is like a uh, like a necessary condition on an adequacy of these notions. That's I think quite a widespread kind of view. That's kind of Ted Sider's view as well. Um, like you know, it's 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 bad news for one of these notions of dependence if they can't make good sense of um, uh, our, our best physics. Um, uh, but the fact that it makes good sense of the physics isn't like decisive that it's correct. There may be like non-physics related considerations of, of mathematical simplicity, for example, that, that tell between them. So um, so I, I definitely think this is a good kind of testing ground because there's some kind of unusual <laughs> relationships between facts and levels and, and entities going on here um, that like more like orthodox and familiar notions of dependence might not uh, handle neatly. Um, and the kind of argument about supervenience is, is an instance of that. Um, but beyond that, like exclusion of supervenience, um, I'm not sure that there's all that much to discriminate between different power, different sufficiently powerful notions here. Um, and uh,
Yeah, so I, I don't think we're going to kind of uh, resolve any arguments from the metaphysics room about which notion of fundamentality is best here um, between these different notions. But were there any particular things you had in mind that sounded like um, you might? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm inspired by your work on metaphysical causation and all the consequences that this might have, the fact that we can have this range of relations that go from full causal to full grounding and everything in between. And I was wondering whether this kind of notion, this kind of freedom in choosing yeah. the kind of relation would be helpful in your yeah. case. Good. Okay, thank you. No, thank you for making that connection. I'm sure I was, I was sure I was missing something and now I've, I've worked out what I was missing. Yeah. Um, so I think actually all of those different relations for simplicity here are folded into what I was calling grounding. Um, because, uh, I mean, this is, you know, to a large extent, this is terminological, but um, what I'm thinking of is kind of really the like, the structural equations framework for representing dependencies amongst facts when I say grounding. I'm not, I'm not assuming that the mediating principles that kind of mediate that connection, sorry if other people, this, this, this terminology is a bit opaque. Um, uh, I'm not assuming that those are like uh, metaphysical principles only. I mean, I, I, do, I do think that like in these sorts of scenarios, that's the right way to think about uh, them, but I haven't seriously actually considered like, um, uh, yeah, um, in short, um, one respect in which this paper simplifies is by lumping all of those things that you're talking about together under the heading of grounding. And the reason I do that is because like with respect to the relevant features of kind of flexibility, uh, um, they they have all that stuff in common just just to just to, just to kind of explain for a moment to everyone else what the idea is the idea is if if you have a kind of dependency that's described in structural terms as like some quantities or variables being functions of others as the kind of most abstract um uh framework for understanding dependence then you can think of the links in those webs of dependence um as supported by general principles of various different kinds, whether those are like traditional dynamical laws, in which case that link is going to look more like a cause and effect relationship, or whether those are like definitions or laws of metaphysics or something like that, in which case those links are going to look more like grounding kind of relationships. Um, but yeah, um, so I haven't actually put a lot of thought into how this links up with uh, um, stuff on like causation versus grounding in, in quantum gravity and, and your work on this. So that's a, a good prompt for, uh, to, uh, to return to that. Thank you. Thank you.